Christmas is coming and holiday travel has returned to pre-pandemic levels, even though the pandemic isn't over yet. Now, as we settle into this gray area between two of the nation's biggest holidays, some doctors warn another surge could be looming. But nobody's canceling Christmas this year. And there are some helpful guidelines to help keep you and those you love safe. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later, we have a very important man spending some of his valuable time with us. Our special guest tonight will be Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs, the Joint Staff Surgeon at the Pentagon. And you, my friends, you're a key part of the show. In just a few moments, we're going to open up our phone lines and invite you into this conversation. But first, let's start with the latest data. Dr. Gold, how are we looking tonight? Well, Christina, let's look carefully at the global data and then at some of the national data. But I think your point about being in this gray zone with the combination of infectious agents, colder weather, more travel, uh, really does uh, put us in a position that we have to be cautious about our planning uh, for the winter holidays. So let's start off with our graphics and as we always do, look at what's going on worldwide. And as you see, there's uh, very little change uh, over the last uh, several weeks. There's still a good deal of intensity of COVID spread in Western Europe, uh, particularly uh, in France, uh, uh, parts of Italy, uh, even some of the Scandinavian countries uh, and the Far East uh, remain uh, very intensely colored, indicating that there's the per case per day, 14 day running average is still high. And when you look at the numbers uh, worldwide, they're really quite striking in that where not only are we over 440,000 confirmed cases, and as you can see, the chart is tipping up there in the last several weeks, but the 14-day running average uh, worldwide is actually up 21%. That's the largest uptick that we've seen worldwide in a very, very long period of time. And that's going to bear quite a bit of scrutiny because we're not seeing that same rate of rise in the U.S. As a matter of fact, when we look at our nation, we're still seeing a concentration of case increases in the Southwest, particularly in the Four Corners, parts of Southern California, but also in the very central uh, breadbasket part of the country around Kansas, parts of Southern Nebraska, uh, parts of uh, Wyoming, uh, Minnesota, uh, et cetera. When we look at the numbers across the United States, you can see the trend does remain positive, but nowhere near the 21% case increase that we saw worldwide over the last 14-day period. Again, just under 42,000 confirmed cases, 13 per 100,000 per day. And that's a 6% increase uh, over where we were uh, 14 days ago. And as you can see, hospitalization is up about 3% as well. When we look at some of the data, uh, you can see that we're in this plateau phase, which is just slowly rising. Uh, and of course, this is just looking at reported COVID cases and the overwhelming majority of COVID cases, unfortunately, are not being reported because they're either not getting tested or they're getting tested with a home antigen test and they're not getting reported uh, for purposes of documentation. So for most of these studies that we report here are just the PCR tests that are being done in hospitals and clinics uh, that do need to be reported to the Centers for Disease Control, which is where our data comes from. But having said that, it is definitely up. You may recall last time we were together, we were at 12 cases per 100,000. <clears> the week before that, we were at 11 cases per 100,000. But as I said earlier, uh, look at New Mexico and Arizona, uh, which are uh, twice to two and a half times uh, the U.S. average. And now we're seeing more activity in the Michigan and other parts of the Great Lakes region. And Kentucky and Utah are up there approximately twice or just under twice uh, the U.S. average per 100,000 uh, per day. When we look at some of the smaller communities, whether they're in Arizona, in Kentucky, or even in Michigan, uh, you can see with the U.S. average of 13 cases per 100,000 per day, uh, there are parts of Arizona that are four and five times uh, the U.S. average, uh, parts of Kentucky, and if you look at Dickinson, Michigan, again, uh, approximately uh, 
uh, four times uh, the, the U.S. average. So again, uh, making the point that this is a disease, as are many infectious diseases, uh, really important in our smaller rural farming and ranching communities. You know, if you look at our wastewater data, the trends, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say, are not favorable, particularly if you look at the red and the amber parts of the country. Uh, you can see that it has shifted to predominantly parts of Illinois, Wisconsin, <clears throat> Michigan, uh, Ohio, Indiana, the Great Lakes region, where you see the brightest orange and red, uh, which are collectively up 13 percent each, or a total of 25 percent, are now moving into the highest rates of COVID viral particles uh, seen in the wastewater. And this is uh, this week. It was 1,112 sites across the United States reporting. Even parts of Nebraska, uh, unfortunately, uh, parts of Southern California. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, Colorado uh, and uh, Southern Wyoming, again, uh, there are wastewater trends that are very concerning, as the wastewater numbers have predicted to a fairly good degree uh, what's going to happen in the future. If you look at the northeastern part of the country, even parts of very rural Maine, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont are, are showing these changes uh, as well. And a lot of this is explained by the variants that we're seeing. You know, you may remember that about a month ago we were well over 90 percent of the BA5 subtype of the Omicron variant. You know, it's hard to believe that it's almost exactly a year ago that we first identified the Omicron variant. And look where we've been uh, with this dominant uh, variant uh, since uh, the last 12 full months. But in the last week, the uh, BA5 subtype has fallen to under 20 percent of the cases, uh, which uh, has now shifted to the BQ1 and the BQ1.1, which are 27 and 29 percent res respectively. The BF variant, 7 percent. You know, previously we've not seen any of this so-called super variant, also known as the XBB strain or the BN1 strains, and we're now seeing uh, approximately 3 percent of those. And that probably explains what's going on globally with these super transmissible strains uh, and the replacement of the BA4 and the BA5 subtypes. When you look at the distribution across the United States, uh, you can see that the BA5 subtypes shown here in the forest green are anywhere between uh, 15 and 25 percent, replaced almost uh, to a, a very large extent, uh, almost 60 or 75 percent uh, with the uh, uh, BQ1 and the BQ1.1 uh, subtypes of Omicron. If you look at our hospitalization rates, you can see they have either, depending upon how far you are from your screen, either plateaued or slowly rising. If you look at the fine numbers, you'll see they are rising. And that is very community specific uh, as well. Uh, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., where our guest is joining us from tonight, just over twice the U.S. average of hospitalizations uh, per day. Uh, Delaware, <clears throat> New York, uh, North Carolina and Arizona one and a half to twice uh, the U.S. average as well. But if you were to look at the smaller uh, rural communities, you'd see a lot of variability also, particularly in the impact of some of our critical access hospitals uh, in our small and most vulnerable uh, communities. If you look at the U.S. map, again, this is hospitalization, uh, well down from where we were a year ago uh, when we went into the early stages of the Omicron peaks. But still very bright spots. You know, look at North Carolina and South Carolina, parts of South Dakota, uh, certain parts of central and southern Texas, and of course, uh, in the Colorado, Utah, uh, New Mexico, uh, Arizona uh, part of our nation. Uh, if you look at the COVID deaths per day, uh, again, uh, we were in a slow but definite decline. Uh, we have actually, unfortunately, gone back up a little bit. And again, the death rates are a lagging indicator. Uh, the overwhelming majority of deaths in a recent report that came out uh, the day before yesterday show that over 90 percent of the deaths uh, that are even ongoing today uh, are in those 65 years of age and older and those with multiple complex medical problems. No surprise, COVID definitely attacks most severely those that are most vulnerable, our senior citizens. 
If you look at the death rates uh, per 100,000 per day <clears throat> uh, on the U.S. average, uh, we're at 0.1, are just over 330 deaths in the last 24 hours. But look at Michigan, nearly four times the death rate. Alaska, three times the U.S. average death rate. Massachusetts, West Virginia, and Wyoming, uh, one and a half to twice uh, the U.S. Uh, death rate. So again, small numbers reported in batches, unfortunately, but there are still American citizens that are dying, hundreds that are dying on a daily basis uh, due to COVID. If we look at the vaccination data, uh, you know, uh, this is the same graphic I could have used for the last several months. Uh, believe it or not, we actually do update it before every single show, but it really hasn't changed. Uh, 68% uh, of Americans have been vaxxed, uh, at least uh, to their first sequence, 34 percent boosted. Again, somewhere between half and a little less than half of what we're seeing in parts of Europe, uh, parts of the Far East, et cetera. Particularly now with this new bivalent booster that's available, which is so effective and so important, we have seen an uptick in the number of vaccines uh, being administered per day, but very small. Uh, compared to the uh, almost 5 million doses uh, that we were administering uh, way back in the spring of 2021 when the vaccines uh, first became available. And there's no question that we are still seeing a good deal of vaccine breakthrough across our country and around the world, but the cases are far less severe, the hospitalization rates are lower, and there's very good data now that these bivalent vaccines uh, do appear to be effective from a recent study reported in Europe uh, for these newer strains, uh, the 1.0 and the 1.1 uh, and other strains that we just uh, described. If you look at the total uh, ILI, influenza-like illness, case fatality rates in the United States, these include all cases of pneumonia, influenza, COVID, uh, etc. You can see from the red line, which is the total, uh, that unfortunately we are moving up, and that just means influenza is spreading, RSV is spreading, uh, and of course we're seeing a, an increase in the number of COVID hospitalizations, which translates into an uptilt uh, in the number of deaths. Indeed, many epidemiologists and public health officers have predicted <clears throat> that in the weeks between now and the winter holidays, this curve is going to continue to rise, particularly after all of the Thanksgiving Day holiday travel. Just a couple of words on what's now known as MPOX, no longer known as monkeypox, renamed by the World Health Organization. So we'll have to get our graphics with the program here. But just over 80,000 confirmed cases now worldwide, almost exactly flat from where we were a week ago. And indeed, if you look at the United States uh, numbers of MPOX, you can see that the c curve continues to fall. Interestingly, it has not gone down, down to zero as to where we were last spring. It's unclear whether it will ever actually go down to zero because there's much more case surveillance. We've also identified a number of individuals with MPOX uh, who are high risk exposures, had no symptoms of the disease but had culturable virus when they were cultured uh, for the MPOX and were ultimately successfully treated. There are also just a number of cases of MPOX that were identified to break through the most potent antiviral <clears throat> known as TPOX uh, to prevent the spread of this disease. So I thought I would share with our audience another cause of death in the United States that has nothing to do with viruses, bacteria, it has nothing to do with cancer, but it has to do with motor vehicle accidents. And I saw this graphic recently, and it really prompted me to do a bit more research. So this is the number of deaths from motor vehicle road accidents per million people worldwide. And this, this particular graphic goes back to 1975, so a long period of time. And you know, if you look at the dark blue line in the middle, that's the United States. And down along the bottom uh, outline there, you see France and you see Japan. <clears throat> and there's a very interesting phenomenon here, is that over the last decade or so, we've plateaued. But particularly during the pandemic, we've really taken an up tilt up, whereas other parts of the world have taken a significant tilt down. So I did a little research as to what was 
underlying this. And it's really quite interesting because whether you look at Germany, the United Kingdom, you look at Italy, Japan, etc., cetera, uh, they have really continued to fall. And indeed, over the same period of time, uh, for instance, if you look at Germany, uh, they're at 32 deaths uh, per uh, 100,000 uh, population. If you look at the United States, uh, we're at 117. So, you know, roughly three and a half uh, to four times that level. And those ratios hold for the United Kingdom, they hold for Italy, they hold for France, uh, etc. And so if we look at the uh, etiology of some of this, uh, let's take France, for instance. This is a really good example. Uh, this actually goes back, uh, you know, almost 50 years. Uh, so at one time, France had about 50 more uh, case fatalities per million inhabitants uh, than the U.S. did. When we were at 200, they were at 250. And then we went into an era of seatbelts, airbags, uh, better traffic signals, etc. And the curves crossed, uh, and they kept getting wider and wider and wider apart, to the point now uh, that the United States has almost three times the number of total motor vehicle accident deaths uh, than uh, we see in France. And when you correct that for the number of miles driven, not just the number per million population, the curves remain approximately the same. And so there's a lot uh, to be learned uh, from these comparisons. If you look at the last five years uh, in the United States, you see in 2017, 2018, and 2019, we went down between 1.2 and 1.9 percent of total motor vehicle deaths. But in 2020, the first full year of the pandemic, we were up 7%. Uh, and in 2021, we were up last year uh, just over 10% uh, in the number of deaths. And by the way, uh, uh, that would be just under 43,000 uh, in, in the U.S. Quite an astounding number uh, when you uh, consider uh, the impact of these uh, motor vehicle accident deaths. One of the interesting things to me uh, is that if you look at uh, where these deaths are occurring, uh, it's actually not the passengers, because over the same period of time between, uh, uh, nine, between 1975 and the present, passenger deaths are actually down 42 percent, driver deaths are down 10 percent. The deaths are occurring in cyclists, up 17 percent, pedestrians, up 19 percent, and look at motorcycle deaths, Ooh. you know, way up. Uh, and uh, that, you know, considering how many young people are driving on motorcycles these days, you know, pretty uh, significant. And then finally, uh, the last graphic I wanted to share with you today is this one. This looks at the impact of the pandemic. So from uh, 2017 uh, up through 2020, what's changed around the world? You can see that there are very few countries uh, other than the United States, that actually have a, a significant increase in the number of motor vehicle related deaths. So, Christina, I, I share these graphics with our audience tonight just to make the point that there are a lot of things uh, that produce death, that produce hospitalization, which we've talked a lot about over the last several months. Uh, and that an extra degree of precaution would be a very useful thing as we get into the holidays, the weather gets colder, the roads get icier, et cetera. And where you are in Nebraska, that's already happening. It's very cold here in Nashville as well. I do know it's that time of year. Maybe you have a safe driving tip to share with us tonight. We want to hear from you. Give us a call. Join our conversation, 877-731-6733 is the number to call. I really don't like that number. Motorcycle crash is up by 140%, Dr. Gold. Now, let me ask you something. Have you ever been on a motorcycle on a freeway? Have I ever driven on a motorcycle? I have never <laughs> driven on a motorcycle on a freeway. Okay. Uh, but let me tell you, when, when I'm driving with cyclists around me, that is probably one of the most uh, nerve-wracking things that I do is uh, have to drive around those uh, individuals. I agree, especially when they have a loud engine and they come out of nowhere. It's very scary. Now, I myself have 
taken the challenge. I rode on the back of a motorcycle with a gentleman. I had to wear leathers, a helmet and everything. It was the scariest situation I've ever been in. And I wanted to pull over and go safely back home right away. I do wonder why that's up by 140 percent. Are people more people driving motorcycles or are they just not driving as cautiously as they used to? Well, you know, it's not just the motorcycle driver uh, herself or himself. Uh, to a large extent, it's the car drivers uh, that are either changing lanes. And, you know, you think about it, uh, if you happen to end up with a, uh, with a fender bender uh, with another car, uh, you may do some uh, roadside damage unless it's a really high-speed accident. If you end up with a fender bender with a motorcyclist or somebody on a bicycle or a pedestrian, uh, they're they're going to lose in that battle routinely. You know, if I had a single piece of advice, it would be don't text when you're driving uh, and certainly limit the amount of cell phone conversation because a recent study has shown that even a cell phone conversation is roughly equivalent to being under the influence in many states. Ooh, and those leathers aren't going to protect you if you hit the ground and you're going at an extreme speed, 50 to 80 miles per hour. So please, please be cautious. We care about you, rural America. All right, let's go back to the pandemic for a moment. According to a Washington Post analysis of the CDC data, it recently came out today, nearly 9 in 10 COVID deaths are happening in people 65 or older. That's the highest rate ever. Are there any measures specifically for the elderly to continue to help protect this vulnerable group? Sure. Well, the best advice, of course, is to be sure they're completely up to date on their vaccines and their boosters to routinely test if they develop any symptoms of congestion, fever, flu-like illness. And if they test positive for COVID, they should definitely get started on an oral drug uh, such as Paxlovid. If they test positive for influenza, Tamiflu is extremely effective as well. Uh, so prevention, staying away from people that are ill, early detection and testing, and then of course, uh, staying up to date on their vaccines. Have the tests, have they become a little bit easier uh, just to endure? I remember getting a PRP test early on and it was rough. Uh, then I had one a little bit later on, most recently a couple weeks ago, and it was rather easy. Are you finding that the testing itself is getting easier so people don't need to be as afraid to go in and actually get that test? Yeah, I think people have gotten better at it, and I think they've, uh, you know, uh, they're less invasive. Uh, frequently, you know, sometimes if you just swab the back of somebody's throat, because these Omicron uh, variants tend to be less in your nose and pharynx, less in what we call the nasopharyngeal areas, and more commonly in your throat, which is why saliva testing is so uh, useful. For instance, I get saliva tested at least once a week. I do that routinely just because I'm with other people. I frequently travel, and I just want to be sure that, uh, that I'm not going to run the risk of, uh, even though completely asymptomatic, of ever uh, transmitting virus to anybody. I've learned uh, very successfully how to spit in a tiny little tube uh, and, uh, and get an answer in just a matter of hours, uh, which is, I think, the most effective way to do it. But you're absolutely right, Christina. The testing has become, even the PCR testing, has become a much more simple proposition. All right. So don't be afraid to get the test because once you get the test, if you are positive, you can get the medication that will reduce your chance of having post-COVID symptoms later on. All right. Stay with us. We are going to pause for a quick break. Scott from Virginia, we know you're hanging on the line for us tonight. Hold on, sir. We will get to your question. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Plus, Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs, the Joint Staff Surgeon at the Pentagon, will join our conversation right after this. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs, who serves as the Joint Staff Surgeon at the, Pen the Pentagon in Arlington, Virginia. That's where he's joining us from tonight. Now, he provides medical to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Joint Staff, and the Combatant commanders. He's very important. He also coordinates all issues related to health services to include operational medicine, force health protection, and readiness among the combatant commands. 
The office of the Secretary of Defense and the services also rely on him. General, we know how important you are. We really appreciate you taking some time for us, even though you're joining us via Skype. We've seen that even in the military, jobs now have become available that you can actually do because of Skype. Talk about how Skype and just being able to talk to people remotely has changed the way that you operate and the landscape of many other workplaces that you also coordinate with. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I'll just say that uh, my mother would have loved that introduction. That was incredibly kind of you. Uh, so there's no question that the COVID pandemic forced us to learn how to do things differently. And, and that's true in the military as well. We've leveraged Zoom and Microsoft Teams and other programs like that to allow us to have virtual meetings instead of in-person meetings. A uh, great example, I meet with my counterparts all over the world, uh, Surgeons General from countries that are our closest allies, sometimes several times a week, and we can have conversations just like this one, uh, which allows us to get work done without having to travel overseas. Now, having said that, the nature of what we do in the military often requires that we have to be there in person. Uh, you know, there's the, the best way to defend our country sometimes is to actually be there and to have that real presence. And so while some of the office functions can be done uh, using telehealth or capabilities like this, we have to be there on the front lines, wherever they might be, taking care of our nation's business. But even in those locations, we use capabilities like this. So if someone needs to talk to a doctor or a nurse, they're able to reach back and do that for many of our remote locations. It's a great tool to help us as military medics take care of those who choose to serve. Absolutely, especially when you consider mental health and how important that is for our brave servicemen and women. Now, I just take a look at your uniform there, very well decorated for your service to our country for good reason. Dr. Friedrichs, as a major general and a doctor, we know that the field of medicine has rapidly been changing over the past 10 years, including the last three years of the pandemic. And so, too, are the ways in which wars are being fought. So tell me, how does someone in your position stay on top of all these changes and ensure that our service members are apprised of both? Well, thanks. I, you know, I think like anybody else, uh, part of it is having discussions like this. Uh, you know, I've had the great privilege and pleasure of knowing Dr. Gold for, I don't know, 20, 25 years now and getting together with him and with other colleagues to understand what they're working on and learning. You know, we've got tremendous talents across the United States at hospitals and at clinics all over this country. And having those discussions helps us stay on top of what's working really well or what's not working so well. And I do the same thing with uh, my colleagues and counterparts around the world. I was just in uh, Brussels, Belgium two weeks ago for a meeting of the Surgeons General from all of the countries in NATO. And a big part of that was talking about what was happening in their countries, what was happening in our country and how we can learn from each other. And there are medical journals that are out there that, uh, that we can use to stay uh, informed of new changes. On the military side, uh, I will say that I am deeply in awe of the Ukrainian people. Uh, for those of you who are tracking the horrible uh, invasion that occurred in February of this year when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, that's one of the most impressive conflicts that we've seen anywhere in the world in many years. And the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian military are doing a remarkable job of showing how they are resisting that Russian aggression. And they're sharing those lessons. One of the people that I met with in Brussels was my counterpart, the Ukrainian Surgeon General, and she was very gracious in sharing the lessons that they are learning as they fight to defend their country. As with everything that we do, it's about communication and about those relationships that we build over our lives. Oh, my goodness. Uh, the Ukrainian Surgeon General, the two of you had a chance to meet. 
We definitely want to hear more about that, if possible. We do want to bring our viewers into this conversation as well. They, too, are stimulated by what you're talking about, what Dr. Gold has been talking about. Let's go ahead and go to the phones. 877-731-6733 is the number to call tonight. We're going to go straight to the phones. As promised, who are we going to first here, Nick? Scott from Virginia. Thanks for joining us, Scott. Go right ahead. Scott, you with us? Oh, I'm here. Uh, yes, a question for Dr. Gold regarding uh, these new variants that are out. I was wondering uh, what his thought was on reinstating people wearing masks, uh, whether it should or shouldn't be done, uh, so that you know we can kind of flatten this curve of new variants as well as uh, the contagion. Uh, the contagiousness of them. Yeah, <clears throat> well, I appreciate the question, Scott. And, you know, it's exactly the right question to ask, and specifically for our audiences, when and if would be the time to start to make some recommendations about more common use of masking. You know, many of us, myself included, traveled uh, over the holiday weekend and uh, let's just say it through the airports and airlines, other than flight attendants and a limited number of individuals, mostly older individuals, frankly, uh, and individuals from other countries, there was very little mask wearing that, that I, at least I saw as I traveled through some of the major hubs in the central and eastern parts uh, of the U.S. But getting back to your question, Scott, you know, I think the time is certainly right. For older individuals, you know, as Christina said, the recent report in the Washington Post today indicated that 90 percent, nine out of 10 deaths occurring in people over 65. Well, people over 65, people with complex medical problems, people being treated for cancer or are on immunosuppressive therapy or have weakened immune systems should wear their masks. Uh, you know, I'd be interested in uh, what Dr. Friedrichs thinks about this and uh, whether there's a threshold that the military would consider for uh, mask use in, in certain centers or certain areas. Uh, thanks, Dr. Gold. So I agree with your recommendation that especially for those who are uh, have a, a number of medical problems or who are older, these are important discussions to have. Uh, we in the military very closely follow the recommendations for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. and. Uh, and so we publish those recommendations and share those with our forces around the world. And we tell folks, if you're concerned, talk to your primary care doctor, your, your primary care nurse practitioner, and ask for their advice. For some people, the answer may be now is exactly the right time to put on a mask. Uh, I think you know one of the real values of wearing masks is not only can it potentially help protect you, but it can protect those around you. And so I would... Also, uh, repeat the advice that you gave earlier about testing regularly, and if you feel sick, stay home. Uh, best way not to spread a cold or the flu or COVID is not to be around other people. And so if you're able to do that, that's probably the best prevention of all. Okay, next up, we are going to go back to the phones, and that gives you an opportunity to call in with your question. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. Doug from Pennsylvania joins our conversation now. Go right ahead, Doug. Yes, thank you. I've been a uh, regular watcher and, and appreciate everything, all of the information that we've gotten over the time that you've been uh, broadcasting. I also am someone who has gotten the most recent uh, bivalent, and uh, Dr. Gold has encouraged me and other listeners to follow that uh, route. That having been said, I've also listened to the charts that uh, Dr. Gold shows each year, uh, each month, each week, excuse me. But uh, the one thing that I've uh, been in my back of my mind for a while, and that is, when we look at uh, the chart that shows us at 34% boosted uh, versus a higher, much higher number of European uh, boosted, and yet they're much higher with the uh, the spread than we are based on the charts that I saw today. I'm just wondering why why we think that is, is the case. 
Well, that's a really important question, Doug, as well. It's one that I've tried to dig into a little bit, and uh, I'll share some of the thinking on it, is that these areas uh, seem to be related to the development of new and very highly transmissible strains of the vaccine. Uh, the current thinking is that these mutations of these new strains occur in immuno in small numbers of immunocompromised individuals uh, in areas uh, that that are high transportation hubs, and so there's a tremendous amount of travel that occurs through Western Europe, through the Scandinavian countries, uh, as well certain parts of the Orient. They also do a pretty uh, effective job of recording test positivity, so it may be that our test positivity rates are artificially lower because of all of the home testing that's going on as opposed to all of the recorded testing that's going on uh, in Europe. I mean, there is no question uh, that the majority of these super transmissible strains, variants, uh, subtypes of Omicron that we're seeing now, uh, including the 1.0 and the 1.1 uh, and others, uh, are originating in that part of the world. And as these viruses outcompete each other, uh, what we see is higher and higher rates. Uh, what we have also noticed, though, is that the ability to prevent severe illness due to the vaccines, due to the boosters, and now, as you said, Doug, uh, with your own, uh, you know, getting the bivalent booster, uh, it is very successful in keeping people out of hospitals and away from severe illnesses. So we need to separate in our mind the infection rate from the hospitalization and death rate. And, uh, and I think that that underlies a good part of the explanation for what you've very accurately observed. Yes, and thank you for watching. We can tell that you've been paying very close attention. We appreciate you very much, Doug. 877-731-6733 is the number to call to join our conversation. We will go to you in a moment, Carol. Hang on for just a second, though. I want to bring Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs back into the conversation. This is important. Obviously, you can't give us too much information, nothing detailed, but we have fared very well when you take a look at the last three years. Our military has done so much for us. They have helped with the vaccines. They have helped administer vaccines. They protected our freedom. And we don't even know what's been going on behind the scenes. If you can, just describe for us how a health crisis like this could have really impacted our national security. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I think this is an incredibly important question when people talk about what should each of us individually be doing during an event like this pandemic. Uh, you know, we stand watch every day. This is what our country relies on us to do. And to do that, our, the men and women in uniform have to be healthy. Uh, some of you may remember that we had outbreaks on some of our uh, operational platforms early in the pandemic, and we even had active duty service members who unfortunately died of uh, COVID infections. We uh, very quickly began offering immunizations as the vaccines became available, just as we've done literally since our country was founded. Uh, you know, we all remember George Washington as the father of our country. What many people don't know is in the Continental Army, back when they were fighting in the Revolutionary War, there was a requirement for people to get vaccinated. Uh, and that has continued ever since. And, and that's been an important part of how we protect men and women in uniform. And as I mentioned, we've been very uh, quick to adopt the recommendations from leaders like Dr. Gold and our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and implement them across the force. Uh, what we do is a 24-7, 365 job. And to do that, we have to stay healthy. Absolutely. And that actually was a very strong point for me when I was determining whether or not I would get vaccinated. I figured if the vaccines are good enough for the men and women who sacrificially protect our freedom, they're good enough for me. <laughs> They're likely going to help me as well. And so I love hearing that from you. All right, we're gonna go back to the phones. Carol from Indiana joins our conversation now. Thanks for joining us, Carol, go right ahead. Okay, um, 
We know some people that have not gotten any of their shots. And, of course, my husband and I have all of them, the boosters included. Uh, they said they do not know what's in the vaccine or the shots, so they're not going to get any shots. So we was wondering if Dr. Gold could. Well, Carol, you know, I've, I've heard that concern from many different people over the years since the vaccines were initially rolled out. And uh, although the clinical trials were large and they were done quickly, meaning tens of thousands, or the early clinical trials were more than 25,000 people each for both the Moderna and for the Pfizer products, uh, and others are as large as 40,000 individuals. But we've now probably administered more than 650 million doses of COVID vaccine in the United States. And the safety profile of the original vaccine sequences and the safety profile of the boosters is as high and as favorable to prevent serious infection as any vaccine we've ever had. You know, uh, many of us growing up, uh, you know, learned about measles, mumps and rubella vaccines, affectionately known as MMR. You know, our kids, uh, d many of them received DPT vaccines, diphtheria our pertussis and tetanus vaccines. And these were all safe, <clears throat> very effective vaccines. The, uh, the smallpox vaccines are very safe and very effective vaccines. But these new vaccines that have been produced to deal with COVID are unquestionably the safest vaccines that have been developed thus far uh, in the U.S. and among the most widely used, not just in the U.S., but worldwide, where we're talking about just an almost an uncountable number of doses that have been administered. And so uh, my advice to you is if uh, your colleagues and friends uh, who have not been vaccinated want to talk about it, and you know, you never want to confront people. You always want to learn what their fears are and why they're concerned and have chosen not to. But you can reassure them that the safety and the efficacy benefit of these vaccines is as high as any vaccine that we have ever uh, developed uh, in this country. Wow. And the potential that it holds for the future of medicine as well. Hard to gauge right now, but very inspiring. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your question. We're going to Iowa next, where Ellen joins us tonight. Thanks for joining us, Ellen. Go right ahead. Hello. Um, I faithfully watch your 530 program here in Iowa, and I've learned a lot. But I am um, 75 years old. I had the bivalent booster. Do I need another? Well, the bivalent booster is the most recent booster uh, that's available, uh, Ellen. And so the question will be, uh, given the fact that it still has good efficacy against these additional strains of the Omicron variant, uh, what would be the appropriate timing to get boosted yet an additional time uh, with this bivalent booster? And there have been absolutely n uh, no recommendations that I'm aware of, either from Pfizer or Moderna, or anything that I've heard from either the Centers for Disease Control or Prevention. I'd ask Dr. Friedrichs uh, if uh, he has any thoughts on this and whether the military has any insight as to reboosting, because it's now been about three months uh, approximately since the bivalence came out. Uh, and our experience has been, even though they seem to be lasting longer, we know that none of these uh, vaccines are gonna last indefinitely. So I wonder, sir, if you've uh, had any experience or any thoughts about that. Well, thanks. I, I think it's a great question. And like you, we are watching this data very carefully. Uh, you know. We're all familiar with getting the flu shot every year. We know that that's a vaccine that is effective but does not last indefinitely. And we believe the same will be true with these COVID vaccines. Uh, and we'll, we'll need to monitor to see what that right frequency is. Uh, Dr. Gold, as you mentioned, with these new variants coming out uh, as quickly as they are, uh, this is going to be an area where it, we will continue to adjust the recommendations that we give within the military 
based on the data that's collected both here in the United States and around the world, in Israel and in Europe and in Asia. Uh, so we know that there will be another COVID shot, just like there's another flu shot uh, every year. But how frequently uh, we will need to give those uh, is yet to be. Yeah, and maybe one day we'll be able to get the flu shot with the COVID vaccine all in one. That would be exceptional. Okay, we're going to pause for a quick break. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your question. Gary from Oklahoma has been hanging on the line. We will get to your question right after this break. Stay with us. You're watching Rural Health Matters only on RFD TV. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center and tonight's special guest, Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs, Pentagon Joint Staff Surgeon. Very important man. And Gary from Oklahoma is joining us. Thanks for hanging on the line. We appreciate your patience. Go right ahead, Gary. Well, thank you for having me. I might say I'm uh, an old, old uh, not World War II, uh, Vietnam pilot, a crowding 80 years old. And I really accidentally tuned in to RFD, which I flip over to see what's going on there. But I always enjoy your programs. But the panel is really excellent, and the questions are asking uh, and uh, getting asked, I should say, and their answers are really informative, and I appreciate it, and thank you all very kindly. I uh, flew internationally for 10 years in the Air Force and took a lot of shots, of course, and flew aviation for 25 years corporate afterwards. So I have a lot of experience taking shots. I never had a problem. And I worry about these people who are anti-vacciners. With all the variants that are popping up, we have, uh, well, that 1.1 in the uh, RQ 1.0. If they keep the breeding field open the way they are with so many people not vaccinated, they don't realize that they're encouraging the the virus to continue to upgrade itself and become possibly more vicious? And what are the chances of a variant becoming as vicious as the first round and having basically a repeat of what we had in January of uh, 21? I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to you all, and uh, thank you kindly for your input. Well, I really appreciate your kind words, Gary, as well, and thank you for your service to our country. As I'm very fond of saying, freedom is not free, and people such as yourself and General Friedrichs uh, protect our freedom, and they sacrifice in many, many different ways, as I'm sure you did. Your point is extremely well taken. The more infection, the more transmission, the more mutation of this virus, we have seen it reproduce and to mutate into more and more variants and subtypes. And indeed, uh, this is just going to be an, a never-ending cycle, uh, as it is for influenza and other viral illnesses, but particularly with the very high rates of transmission in certain parts of the world, some of which are completely uh, not even being measured right now, such as in the developing countries. We were doing uh, a very inadequate job of counting the number of cases, getting people vaccinated, uh, and getting people tested. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that is the only way we're going to really break this cycle, is to get a critical mass of people effectively vaccinated to the point that we can stop the case-to-case -case transmission, the so-called community-acquired spread. And indeed, uh, <clears throat> without the vaccines and without appropriate uh, precautions, uh, we're going to be talking about COVID for a very, very, very long time to come. Uh, we will learn to live with it better, We'll get better treatments and prevention strategies, uh, more simplistic, less uncomfortable testing, but it's going to be around for a long time. Mm. And I will bring you back into the conversation, Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs, because you can relate on many levels, but particularly the Air Force. If you can, tell us a little bit about your background and why you decided to join the Air Force to begin with. 
Well, thanks. And uh, I want to say thanks to Gary also. It's uh, kind of neat to hear a fellow airman uh, on the line here. Uh, so I come from a Navy family. Actually, uh, I was a great disappointment to my family when I joined the Air Force, and they still jokingly <laughs> say that they were hoping I'd make something of myself and join the Navy. Uh, my wife is an ex-Army doctor, and we have a son who is uh, talking about becoming a Marine. So for us, this is a little bit of the family business. Like so many people in rural America, this is this is part of what we believe is is an important part of of being an American, and, uh, and it's that sense of service. Uh, I chose the Air Force uh, because it, uh, at the time, was very involved in the space program as it is today. Uh, I always liked jets, and uh, I liked the opportunity to work in new areas. Uh, as I now have spent 37 years in uniform and sit at the Joint Staff working with all of the services, I can say with great pride that, you know, there's some outstanding people in every service uh, and the, the opportunities that we have as we support and defend the country are really remarkable. So thank you for the question and thanks, Gary, for your service. Yeah, and thank you to all the servicemen and women out there watching us tonight and the family members, of course. We are grateful. We are 4.2% of the world's population. We are the leader of the free world. We have so much to be thankful for, and it's all directly correlated to our strong military, the brave men and women who sign up and go out there and do what it takes. We are going to go to one more phone call. Jake from Alabama, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Go right ahead. Yes, I've been listening. I've not heard the term ivermectin used one time. The government came out against it early on. They pulled us off of the shelves at Tractor Supply. Doctors won't even discuss it, but if you look at the map, you see North Africa has almost zero uh, COVID places. And yet they won't, you can't get a doctor to admit doing it. They'll do it on the side, but they are being threatened if they use it. And that's my comment. I've not heard ivermectin used one time here tonight. Well, Jacob, first of all, thank you for calling and thank you for your observation about some of the case transmission rates. Uh, you know, I can only just report to you what we've read and what the scientific community worldwide uh, has concluded. Uh, and that is, while there have been some anecdotal experiences of the use of ivermectin, and by the way, the use of other drugs as well, uh, the scientific data uh, has shown that the risk-benefit ratio is just not there. And particularly now with extremely effective oral drugs like Paxlovid, which were uniquely designed uh, to combat the severity of illness to prevent death and hospitalization uh, from, uh, from the COVID viruses, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. Uh, I mean, it's got a unique capability uh, to prevent serious infection and to prevent hospitalization and to prevent death. And I, I, you know, I certainly understand that this anecdotal experience uh, with not just ivermectin, but with a number of other therapies uh, that have been used in the early days before we really knew how to target and stop the severity of illness and stop the spread uh, of this virus. But we're in a very different place, Jake, now than we were two years ago. And so, you know, when I have a family member or a friend that calls me and says that they were just diagnosed uh, with COVID, they got mild or even moderately severe symptoms. Uh, if they're within the first five days, our recommendation for them and for anybody else is to go with the proven therapy. In this case, uh, it's the uh, prescribed Paxlovid. Okay. Well, with that, thank you. And we got a follow-up from Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs. We only have a few moments left. I just wanted to sincerely thank you both for being here for Rural America. We know that this is not your first trip on the show. Major General Dr. Paul Friedrichs, thank you for coming back and for keeping us thank informed. You. We have so much strength because of our military. Watching what you do, the example you set, helps us follow. So thank you for having a relationship with Dr. Gold. And Dr. Gold... Thank you for being here for us for the past three years. We've got about 30 seconds. What are your final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Paul, it's for you. <laughs> Thanks to everyone who's sent their sons and daughters to serve or who's worn the uniform there. You know, we've, we are in a remarkable country. And as you said, Dr. Gold, freedom isn't free.
I know it Get is. your vaccine. Thanks. God bless you. And thank you for watching us tonight and support our military men. Look into signing up if it's something that you've been interested in. Thanks for joining us tonight.